Well, if you've got your Bibles, take them and go to John chapter 6, verses 25 through 35, where we'll be today. And if any of you saw our predictions yesterday, um, that's why we don't bet on the horses, because I don't think in my entire life I've picked one derby winner, and Gray came the closest because he wanted the black horsey to win. So, should just actually we should just all do what Sam does. Sam during the race started cheering for whoever was in the lead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Dad, aren't you gonna do this? And I was like, Sure, buddy. I'll yeah. <laughs> My horse. Every time I pick him, he just he's the one that like trips over himself and falls. But, anyway. but one of the best things that we have in our house is our dustbuster. Uh, we absolutely love the dust buster because you have no idea how many times or how much food can go from the kitchen to the table to our kids' mouths to the chair to the floor and the dust buster helps out so much with that. But one of the things that we love about the dust buster since we moved to Florida is because of all the sand. We can't get rid of it. We had a friend from uh, Kentucky text and say, oh, I wish I could have sand between my toes. And I said, come over to the house. We have it in the laundry room. We have it in all of our shoes. It's in all of our swimsuits. It's in the car. We can't get rid of it. No matter how many times we go to the beach, we come back, I take the van and get it vacuumed out. I get the dust buster. We get all of these things to try to clean the sand out. It's never enough. No matter how many times we take the dust buster to the kids' shoes, they constantly keep finding more sand. No matter how many times we get under the seats, no matter how many times we get into the floorboards, it's never enough because there's always going to be more sand. So many people around us live like that, except instead of pushing out sand and trying to get rid of sand, they're trying harder to find their joy, to find their satisfaction through something. Whether it's they try to find it through having enough money or enough sex or enough stuff or enough toys or enough pleasure or enough experiences or trips or whatever it might be. They're constantly left with the same thing like we are with the sand in the van. No matter how much you try, no matter how hard you work at it, you're never going to get rid of it. It's never going to be enough. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning with Jesus as the bread of life. Because he provides our greatest need. So let's read John 6, starting in verse 25. When they, the crowds, this is the crowds that are following him around, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he, God the Father, has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the promise that Christ has given to us that if we trust in him, he will never leave us hungry. We will never crave what doesn't satisfy. We will never long for what doesn't fill because in him we have everything. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, Jesus is the bread of life, provides our greatest need, and there's three things that... Um, we can draw out from this. The first is that the bread of life is not a means to an end. So the context that we find ourselves in is Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And if we do the digging, we find that the 5,000 is only the 5,000 men. So the conservative estimate is 10,000. The more broad estimate is that this was up to 20,000 people that Jesus fed miraculously. 
So if we were to take a giant pro basketball arena, fill it to capacity, and then that's the number of people that were fed. And then enough left over that the disciples picked up 12 baskets. And we're not talking little Easter baskets. We're talking big baskets of leftovers as a message. And the crowd saw this and was amazed. Then we find out that Jesus, in escaping the crowd, can't take the boat because the boat's already gone. So instead of walking around the lake, he walks across the lake. And the crowd is amazed at this. So they've seen the feeding. They realize Jesus walks on water. And in response to that, they ask him, what's next? What are you going to do next, Jesus? Later in the chapter, Jesus is finally going to have enough with the crowd. He's going to tell them, look, if you really want to follow me, eat my blood, drink my flesh. Or eat my flesh, drink my blood. And if you want to do that, you can follow me. And in verse 66, which is where we're going to be next week, a lot of them just pack up and go home. They were interested in Jesus as long as he could keep them fed, happy, and entertained to keep doing the miracles and the wonders. See, they saw Jesus as a means to an end. So they were using Jesus. They were chasing after Jesus so that they could get food, so that they could be entertained, so that they could see the miracles and be amazed by them and be impressed by them. But they weren't interested in Jesus. They were interested in what Jesus could give back to them. And unfortunately, these people were using Jesus so that they could get their fill, which still happens today. It happens every day when you turn on the TV and some hack in a suit is telling you that if you send him money, God will make you rich. That you can be blessed and that if you're not rich as a Christian, you're doing something wrong. GQ a few weeks ago ran an article about one of these hacks. And in the article, they talked about, they talked to former employees that said, when these people that were sincere and sending in their money, because this predator is preying on the sympathies and the, and the sensibilities of the poor, when they'd send in their earnest requests for prayer, when they would send in the seed offering that this charlatan promises to them, I'm going to get started and I may not stop because I don't like these guys, can you tell? Yeah. And, and so this guy starts, so the, 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 the former employee tells him when these people would send in their prayer requests and their seed money, what they would do is they would take the money out and throw the prayer requests away. They didn't even read them, they didn't care. All they were interested in was the money. Then they managed to find where the guy's miracle spring water came from. It came from a tap in Jersey. If you've ever been, yeah, Jersey. If you've ever been to Jersey, I've never been to Jersey, but I wouldn't trust the water. And this is what's being hacked. And so this guy's, these, these people are, are selling this, and people are, are using Jesus, using this as an excuse to get rich. It's pushed by a therapy culture that just sees Jesus kind of as a wonder pill for our anxiety. So we lay on the couch and we tell, we, we give our childhood and we explain how we got spanked when we were seven and it warped our, our frame of mind. And in the end, we see people that just simply pat you on the head and, and, and give you a therapy answer. It's pushed by a misapplication of the phrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, where we attempt to just smooth everything over where we make it so that there's no difficulty. This weekend, Nike put on an exposition to see if they could break a two-hour marathon. If you're doing math, that's about four minutes and 34 seconds per mile. It's roughly 14 miles an hour. So this afternoon, one of you get in the car, start driving 14 miles an hour. The other of you keep up with it for 26 miles. And what they did was they did it on a flat racetrack. No sharp corn, corners, no hills, optimum conditions to see if they could do that, to remove all of the barriers that were in the way. The guy came up 25 seconds short. It was amazing seeing how effortlessly this guy was running because there was no barriers. And so many times we do that when we tell people about Jesus. Is we just simply, we, we say, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, and it's going to smooth everything out. That's, that's not what happens more often than not. See, the promise of God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life isn't that everything's going to be smoothed out and everything's going to be okay and nothing bad will ever happen to you. The promise of God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life is that when you go through the difficulty, you're not doing it alone. Amen. 
you're not going through it by yourself. It's displayed whenever we see churches, well-meaning, well-intentioned, develop a buffet style to ministry. See, the thing I love about buffets is that as you're working down the buffet, if you don't like what's right in front of you, guess what you do? You step over and you keep going until you find it. Or you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and this and that. And what happens with this is it becomes in churches an ad, a, a preference-based economy. Preference becomes the currency of engagement. So it's everything is about your preference. And everything is about these niche nuances rather than coming together for a feast, coming together for a meal. It just simply becomes, well, if you don't like Brussels sprouts, then you can slide down to get broccoli. If you don't like that, then you can get mashed potatoes. If you don't like that, then you can get rice. And you just keep going down the line. And here's the thing, is it's a never-ending vortex. It never stops. It never consumes enough. You're always going to be left wanting. You're always going to be left wanting more. And Jesus tells them, stop settling for this. Stop settling for things that will never leave you, that will constantly leave you wanting. One of the commentaries that I, that I found was talking about what Jesus was saying in verses 25 through 27. When he says, don't work for food that perishes, but for food that endures. You've chased after me because you, you, just, you didn't see the signs you wanted, the bread is it's the image of the person grazing, an animal grazing and gorging. Or the person at a potluck that piles their plate, and then when they get to the table, they put both elbows so that they can fight off anyone that may come and steal their food. And they're just gorging themselves on it. And they're going back for more, and they're constantly feeding because it's never enough. One of the things that, that I loved when we got engaged was the wedding registry. And what's great about a wedding registry is that you can go to the store, wherever you might go, Bed Bath & Beyond, Target, Dillard's, and you get a concierge that asks you if you need anything, they give you snacks, they give you refreshments, and they give you this wonderful toy to play with for the next couple hours. The scanner gun. And you know that whatever you scan, someone's probably going to buy it for you. And so you can go and you can click on whatever you want. I remember we had so much fun with that because we walk through and be like, that's a nice toaster, click. That's a nicer toaster, delete, click. And you can go through and you know that people are going to buy these things for you. And you know that you're going to get gifts as a result of, of having a wedding registry. Here's the thing. Jesus, the people that are following Jesus to get their fill are just like a couple that gets married so they can get a waffle iron. You completely missed the point. Because if you're getting married so that you can get a waffle iron, or so you can get a new set of sheets, or so you can get flatware, you're missing the point. And for Jesus, the people that are following after him so that they can get bread, so that they can keep being entertained, are completely missing the point. They're viewing Jesus as a means to be used to get somewhere when Jesus promises and Jesus gives himself as the end and the means and everything in between. Second thing that we see is that the, the bread of life is received by faith. So in verse 20, 28, the crowd responds, what must, we be, what must we do to be doing the works of God? They want to know how much it costs. What do we need to do? How much of a check should we write? Give us the checklist of things that we need to do. See, it's working off an assumption that good works and good things are how we become acceptable to God or we get his favor. Everybody has a price, right? Great philosopher Ted DiBiase said that one time, that everybody has a price and everybody can be bought and everybody has a limit to where you can buy their action. And what God tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 2 is Isaiah tells the people, why are you spending your money for that which is not bread? Why are you laboring for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. See, the crowd is chasing after this thing of satisfaction that will always leave them wanting, which will never be enough, and they're using Jesus to get there. And Jesus' response is, you can do something else. And they think, well, what do we have to do? What's the checklist? But Jesus turns everything on its head. 
Verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. See, the work isn't work. The work is faith in the one whom He has sent. The work, the way we receive this bread, the way that we get the bread that never leaves us hungry, the way that we get the water that never leaves us thirsty, the way that we get this satisfaction that all of us are longing for, the deepest craving of our heart, the way we get that is that we don't work for it. We receive it as a gift by faith. It really is that easy. <coughs> The crowd was asking for a sign as Moses gave with the manna. Jesus was indeed the one sent from God. See, this revealed, as the Holman commentary says, that their primary interest was food, and they were attempting to goad Jesus into giving them bread in exchange for their faith. It really is that simple. The manna nourished and fed and carried the Israelites through the wilderness. That was a gift that came down from heaven that all they had to do was receive it. All they had to do was pick it up. God <coughs> delivered. God did the work. And for us, God has given the bread of life in Christ that really is that easy. This isn't something that we work for. This isn't something that we overcomplicate. The way that we receive this bread is by faith. It is as easy as it sounds. It is as accessible as it sounds. That's the difference between what the world would say, where you have to earn everything, because we live contractually. We do all of this stuff. I pay for food. I want it brought to my table. We don't do this with the grocery store when you go check out. You say, can I receive this on faith? The clerk will <laughs> stare at you and call a manager. We don't do that. We live contractually. We do. We give and we work so that we get something back. And what God's promised in his word about the bread of life is that it's easier than that. God assumes the work. God assumes the labor. God assumes the initiative. God takes the first step. And he asks us to receive the gift. We don't earn our salvation. We don't earn our position with God. That is a free gift for us to receive. God's the one that does the work. God's the one that takes the initiative. Amen. And the third thing that we see from this in verses 33 through 35 is that the bread of life is able to satisfy and fulfill. A couple weeks ago we went over the Samaritan woman. Jesus told her, if you will listen, you will get water that will never leave you thirsty. And she, like the, like the crowd does, assumes that Jesus is talking about physical. That he has access to a spring. That he has access to a fountain where the water is so pure, the water is so clean, that it will never leave her thirsty again. And the crowd assumes that when Jesus is talking about the bread of God, that he's going to deliver some bread, some food, something they can touch and hold that's going to leave them never hungry again. And he's, tell, he's doing this, uh, this is a common theme in John where Jesus takes the physical to teach about the spiritual. And that's what he's doing here, is he's taking the physical and he's using it to make connections. See, here's the thing. In Christ, we've received everything we need. We have no need or want. He himself is the one that satisfies. He himself is the one that never leaves us hungry. Because in him, we are satisfied. In him, we have everything that we need. The outflow of that is an attitude of contentment. The outflow of that is contentment. We're content with where God has us. We're content where the Lord has placed us. We're content with what his plan is for us because he's enough. No matter what it is, whether it's the rush of a roller coaster, the craving of good food, the thrill of traveling to exotic places, we're always going to want something more. The brand new gadget that you spend all your money on, three months from now, will be obsolete because they're going to come out with another new gadget. They're going to come out with another new car that's nicer than the one that you overpaid for. And the one that you put all that money into is going to depreciate in value to the point where you're upside down and underwater on what you owe for it. You're going to go to a yard sale. You're going to go to a storage clearance. You're going to go to a thrift store. And you're going to find yesterday's treasures. You're going to find the things that people found yesterday to satisfy them. That when something newer, better, faster came out, 
It replaced whatever they had put their hopes in before. Jesus knows that if he's going to give the people bread, they're going to want something afterwards. They'll be like a child who spends an entire week at Disney World in the happiest place on earth, meeting the characters, riding the rides, doing everything. And after that week at Disney World, gets in the car, buckles their seatbelt, and says, when are we going to SeaWorld? <laughs> Jesus is enough for us. Jesus is enough. If we lose everything, if, we're like, if we find ourselves in the position of like Job, who lost his family, who lost his home, who lost everything, for him, God was enough. Can it be said of us that we can go through the worst, that we can find ourselves losing everything and still being content because we have Christ? Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, contrasts the earthly treasures with the heavenly treasures. And he says, you got two choices where you want to store, what you want to put everything in. You can pick earthly treasures, and you can store up a wealth of those. You can fill your house, you can fill your garage, you can fill the storage unit that you buy after you filled your garage. And you can chase after all of these things, these worldly treasures, these things that are built to impress us now. And you can buy the new television, you can buy the computer, you can buy the brand new gadget. But then in six months when that gadget's obsolete and you buy the next one, then you've, got a, then you've got something that's going to a yard sale. So your earthly treasures end up finding themselves in yard sales and landfills. We had a friend in Kentucky that managed a thrift store, and that was one of the things he always talked about, was he would just watch people bring yesterday's treasures and just give it away, because it, to them it wasn't worth anything anymore. We can do that. We can store those up. We can look at those earthly treasures to satisfy. We can look at those to fulfill. We can look at those to give us, to scratch the itch that all of us have. Or we can go to the other side. And we can store up heavenly treasures. And we're not quite sure what those heavenly treasures are. If it's, um, you know, what we've given to invest in the kingdom. If it's people that we've invested in and shared Christ with. If it's the work that we've done in our faithful service, or a combination of all three, or maybe even more. But the difference is between those two is that one is trying to satisfy us here and now, and it will never be enough because it's never supposed to be enough. And the other is treasure that we've accumulated, that we've stored up, that we've put aside, that is going to satisfy, that does meet the long belonging. And if we store up enough of those, then we're promised to see what that looks like, whatever that might be. And it doesn't rot or rust or disappear or lose value. It's, it's an extension of the kingdom. It's an expansion of the kingdom. Everything else is going to rot and fade, but that which is stored in heaven lasts forever. I had a friend when we were in college that got married, and he asked me to be in the wedding party, so that means you get to go to the rehearsal dinner. And he had it at some nice restaurant, and everybody, you know, we all got there. He said, all right, here's the menu. Pick whatever you want. It's on, my, it's on us. We've got it. We're taking care of it. I have really cheap taste on my own, but if someone else is picking up the tab, <laughs> so I'm looking over the menu, and I see some things that sound good, and at the very bottom, filet mignon. Hmm. I've never had one of those before. Someone else is paying for it. You do the math. Now I'm going to try something because I don't have to pay for it. And I remember as a kid seeing it on the menu and asking, can I get that? No, that's too expensive. Okay. So I order it. And you always hear this about how wonderful it is. This, this piece of steak comes out that's about the size of a quarter. And they put it in front of me. And cut it and eat it. And yeah, it's good. And yeah, it was nice. And maybe I just got a bad one and I didn't get the, didn't understand the hype behind it. But I remember leaving the rehearsal dinner going, man, I'm hungry. <laughs> if we're honest with ourselves, we're looking at bread that never leaves us satisfied, that always makes us hungry. And Jesus promises to give us bread that will never leave us wanting, that will never leave us craving. So many other things we trust in 
end up failing us, just like a filet mignon that tastes good, that fills you for a moment, but then leaves you hungry afterwards. So applications, three, three folds this morning, and it all revolves around Christ. The first thing is that we crave Christ. See, if we chase after, if we crave, if we pursue something else, whatever that blank is, and you can fill that blank with whatever you want, relationships, money, pleasure, employment, uh, bank account, popularity, fame, whatever it might be. You fill that blank with whatever you want. If that's what you crave, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough that's going to not make you want more. But if we crave Christ, If we long for Him, if we desire Him, then He satisfies. He gives enough. And everything else becomes secondary. Because the second thing, we are satisfied in Him. We are satisfied in Christ. If you have Jesus, you have enough. You have enough. Beyond that, it's icing on the cake. So when we get things in perspective, if we have Christ as what we crave, then we see everything else, we see all the stuff around us as icing on the cake, as nice gifts, as wonderful goods that God blesses us with, if He chooses to. But we don't look at them as gods. And that's what happens so often, is we mistake gift for God, And we make the gift out to be something greater than it's supposed to be. It's just like getting married so you can get a brand new toaster. Because unlike God, capital G God, the lowercase g gods that we chase after will never be enough. Which brings us to the third one. Cling to Christ. So we crave Him, we're satisfied, but then we also cling. And we hang on tight. When we go through the tough times, when we go through the times where nothing makes sense, when we have to say goodbye to someone that we love, when we lose a job, when we lose a house, when we lose anything, when we hit rock bottom, we cling to Him and we hang on tight because His promise is that He never leaves us or forsakes us. And where we run when we need the moat, what we, when, we need, when we are at our worst, where we run to tells us something about ourselves. And if we run and cling to Christ, then we are showing ourselves, we're showing the world that the place of our strength, the source of our hope, doesn't come from whatever the blank is. It comes from Christ. But also we cling to Him at the highest of highs. Because not only does it show a lot about ourselves when we run to something in the point of need, but also in the point of plenty. It's very easy to be a believer in a foxhole. It's very easy to be a fervent prayer when things aren't going well. Because we all recognize that. It's totally different when everything's going great. We still then cling. Because we know that the pattern of this life is like a roller coaster. It is up, it is down. And when things are going really well, we are entering the point where we are about to go into a crisis. You're always either in the middle of one, coming out of one, or getting ready to go into one. Welcome to the fallen world. That's Genesis 3 in a nutshell. So we cling to Him because He is never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And we cling to Him in that because when we cling to Him, we're saying, you're enough, you're enough, you're enough. I can get through this as long as I have you. That tells us something. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. And we're going to sing it. And for some of you, this is your time. You need to sing this as a prayer, as as a reflection of your own desire to God. Help me trust you more. There's one line in there, oh, for grace to trust him more. Maybe that's what you need to just hang on this morning is the prayer, I need to trust you more, so give me the grace to trust you more. Maybe this is the day where you can't sing "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus because you've never trusted Him to start with. And the offer of the morning, the offer of the bread of life, is come to Jesus, who will satisfy, who will give, who will provide, who will meet your longings. 
not just in this life, but in the life to come. Because for all those that chase after something in the blank, when this is all past, those things won't be there anymore. But for those that have Christ, Jesus steps in and says, I've paid it. They're with me. They're not alone. They're with me. If you can't trust in Jesus, if you can't trust Him this morning as we sing, because you never have, then the invitation is open for you to give yourself to Him. Cry out to Him. It really is that easy.